Good morning, this is Tyler Crone with The Thundering 36. We are so delighted to be in conversation with one of our city council candidates, Alexis Rink. Please introduce yourself and share a little bit more of why you're running and welcome, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Alexis Mercedes Rink. I'm a renter, a transit rider. I used to be a waitress and now I'm running for Seattle City Council to fight for a city that works for all of us, not just a select few. Throughout my public policy career, I've gained a reputation for bringing people together around solutions and making them happen. I got my master's degree at the University of Washington and I've been working on housing and budget issues with cities and service providers to support communities most impacted across all of Seattle and King County. I know that I am the best candidate to unseat Tanya Wu, who got her start in politics, siding with Republicans working against solutions for homelessness, because I got my start in policy uniting communities to address homelessness. And I'm ready to bring my perspective as someone whose family has been impacted by incarceration, homelessness, and substance use disorder, as well as my policy expertise to the City Council to fight for housing investments, worker protections, climate action, and social justice. I will be a champion for progressive revenue. Corporations and the wealthy need to pay up because we cannot continue to cut necessary services like library hours as we face a massive budget deficit. And I'm excited by the early momentum my campaign has gained with nearly 2000 people already having given uh, their democracy vouchers or donated in our first month. And it's just clear that Seattleites believe in this movement to ensure that our city is affordable, welcoming and leading the way to a better future. Thank you so much. Our first question this morning will be asked by Laura Marie. Hi, um, if elected, to which standing committees of the city council will you seek appointment and what special qualifications do you bring to the ongoing work of those committees? Thank you. I'm so excited by this work because I believe I have a lot of opportunity or a lot of expertise to offer across many, if not all of the committees because of my work experience. For the Finance, uh, Native Communities, and Tribal Governments Committee, I was previously the Director of Subregional Planning and Equitable Engagement, which meant creating and holding up our partnerships with Native service providers and tribes. I've worked with Muckleshoot and Snoqualmie Valley tribes, as well as Seattle's Tribal Liaison, um, and I continue to be in relationship with Native service providers, such as Chief Seattle Club, and we'll actually be there later this month talking to their membership. I know Native identity is not a monolith, and I actually understand those key nuances because of my work. But further, I currently work at UW's uh, Finance Planning and Budgeting Office as the Assistant Director of Policy Planning and State Operations, and I lead a body of work uh, related to constructing and communicating UW's $10 billion budget. So my daily responsibilities involve working with academic units on tuition rates, fee-based programs, provisos, student fees, I work in a lot of spreadsheets. Um, I've specialized in public finance in graduate school, and I know what a healthy budget should look like and think I could contribute that knowledge to the committee. Just by way of a rapid fire round, there's the Housing and Human Services Committee. I've spent the uh, past five years working in human services from regional boards committees, as well as, again, the Director of Subregional Planning and Equitable Engagement. I understand how our local programs operate, how they're funded, and how they could be improved. I'd also seek uh, working on the land use committee. There's a natural connection here with housing and I've worked on land use matters when I was a policy analyst with the Sound Cities Association and I worked with county staff to develop the countywide planning policy, countywide planning policies um, as a part of uh, the Growth Management Act. And this is that document that um, the comprehensive plan for Seattle must fall under. And then lastly, um, the Public Safety Committee, as a strong advocate for police accountability and someone who's worked in homelessness, I bring that perspective and expertise, and I support building our alternative response models. And I want to see an expanded strategy for how we respond to public safety scenarios, knowing that a uniformed officer is not always the best fit for every scenario. We need quick response times, and we need the right person responding to each scenario. Thank you. Alex W.? Uh, hi. Uh, what steps will you take to ensure that the city remains safe for all, including Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQ plus people, uh, while keeping police accountable to elected leadership and community? Mm -hmm. 
We know that the safest communities are well-resourced communities. So to keep Black, Indigenous, communities, color, LGBTQ communities safe, we must maintain and expand our investments that are already serving those communities as it stands. And this means holding those priorities when it comes time for budget deliberations. And with the conservative extremist legislation being passed around our country that restrict the rights of women, our LGBTQ community, immigrants, people living with disabilities, people will look to cities like Seattle as safe havens that welcome and celebrate human rights. And we must be prepared for that increase of people moving to our city and have legal protections in place to ensure that anyone who comes is welcomed into our community and is safe. And lastly, as a strong advocate in my life for police accountability and having stood alongside Seattle's Black community in calls for justice and cries for accountability, I know from those movement spaces the importance of centering communities most impacted. I will work alongside those partners in this space to evaluate our current accountability mechanisms from the Community Policing Commission, the Office of Police Accountability, the Office of the Inspector General, while also examining our bargaining processes. Thank you so much. Our next question will be asked by Barbara. How would you ensure the city has an updated climate action plan? And what specific actions would you prioritize to get us back on track to meeting Seattle's clean um, uh, Green New Deal goals? Yes, the city is committed to goals of making Seattle free of climate pollutants by 2030. We have prioritizing investment in communities historically most harmed by um, economic, racial, and environmental injustice, advancing, advancing an equitable transition um, of our economy, and also ensuring that we're creating stable, well-paying jobs, prioritizing local hire as we're building towards a green economy. So I truly believe we need to be building in climate action in every area where we're working from housing development and transportation infrastructure. And there have been a number of stated and committed strategies um, from planning documents and um, the Green New Deal initiatives that are funded through Jumpstart. But as our city has been facing a budget crisis, there is a faction that would like to use Jumpstart monies to cover the deficit. So we need to make progress on address addressing our climate goals, and we need to actually fully fund our initiatives. And I stand for protecting those funds and making sure that they remain dedicated to advancing Green New Deal initiatives. So as we update any any uh, climate action plans, we need to be working with frontline communities that have bared the brunt of environmental impacts from our lack of action on climate change and leadership from those communities must ensure that our next steps are not contributing to displacement. And so I support modernizing our infrastructure investments and working alongside state and federal partners to modernize our existing public buildings um, and really pushing for Seattle's green building standard. Um, ensuring that we are targeting critical projects that increase green spaces such as parks, community gardens, urban forests, establishing our workforce development initiatives that are focused on training people in green industries, and thinking through how we combat our car emissions by thoughtfully investing in greener modes of transportation and expanding our public transportation. Thank you so much. Our last prepared question this morning will be asked by Shep. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and you've already touched on this a bit, but the city has been in a homelessness crisis, a uh, homelessness state of emergency since 2015, yet our homelessness crisis has not receded. What are you doing? What are we doing wrong? And what steps will you take to address the crisis? I appreciate this question. I led the development of the five-year plan to address homelessness and worked for over a year across 39 cities with 100 service providers. I've stood in encampments with our unhoused neighbors. I've reviewed 2,500 public comments in the plan and I ran 40 workshops. I could probably talk your ears off for the next week on the state of our system and the challenges facing this, but I wanna say three things today on this. KCRHA is not operational in its current form. Some of that is by design and some of that is due to failures in executive leadership. And I'm calling for the stabiliz a stabilization plan for the agency as they're hiring their new CEO and a reset on what the role of KCRHA is and the relationship and role of cities and other authorities around it because KCRHA cannot do it alone, which leads to my second point, which is homelessness represents the failures of many systems, prisons, foster care, healthcare, and behavioral health, immigration and asylum, we have opportunities to intervene and prevent homelessness at so many junctures and other systems. We know what those are. And we know someone is at risk of homelessness, for example, when they have their lights shut off. 
Falling behind on utility payments is a warning sign, and we could intervene at that point and work with City Light to connect that person to services because it is more affordable, efficient, and less traumatizing for everyone if we intervened at that point. We can do better and we know how to do better, but we need other systems to see themselves as a part of working on this too, and I will be a champion for that. And lastly, we know program models that work. We know that homelessness is a housing problem and we must remain steadfast and we need to develop more types of housing across all communities in Seattle. Um, and we must keep our investments in them and expand them. We also know that case management and peer navigation is a model that relies on being able to walk alongside someone as they're navigating each bureaucratic system. And when that can happen over a course of, of a period of time, that person can stabilize but we need wages for those frontline public service servants so they can afford to stay at that job for long enough as they're supporting somebody in their pathway. Um, as, and that, uh, that public servant uh, needs a wage to be able to live, work, and play in Seattle as well. So I will be a champion for pay equity for our human services system. Thank you. This ends our formal questions. We will now go to follow-ups. We'll try to keep those close to about a minute answer. I know that might be hard to do, but let's call on Jeremy first. Thank you, Alexis. Okay. I just pasted this in the chat as well. You had mentioned at the end of question three, investment in greener modes of transportation. Can you go into a little bit more detail about which investments you would prioritize? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, as a transit rider myself, um, I believe that uh, Seattle, we need leaders on Seattle City Council that'll be a strong voice and partner with um, Sound Transit, as well as partnering with King County Metro. So greener modes of transportation really tied to how do we continue to invest in our um, light rail system and work on electrification, um, being able to um, have uh, buses that also create more horizontal forms of transportation branching off from light rail is a really important uh, piece of this as, as well. And so that would be something I, I'd be really focused on. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Dawn. I have put it in the chat for you to read as well. Um, transit station locations have been passionately debated in West Seattle and Chinatown International District, yet Sound Transit and city officials have largely overlooked an area that would benefit from the rail the most, White Center, SeaTac, Des Moines, and Burien. What will you do to ensure that the rail will eventually reach largely Latino, Black, Southwest, Southeast Asian diasporas to access jobs and services in the city? Mm -hmm. I think, for, thank you for this question. I, I think first and foremost, working alongside a number of community organizations that are at the forefront and best understand what those communities need and ensuring that as we, one, we needed to invest and prioritize that type of investment, but two, making sure it's actually designed in the way that best meets the needs of those communities, where they, they need to get to, um, the timing of which, the cadence of that transportation as well. And so a big part of that um, should be really formed by those communities. Thank you so much, Alexis. Our next follow-up question will be from Alex Beharin. Hey, Alexis, I put the question in the chat, but I wanna focus on uh, progressive revenue since you mentioned it in your question earlier. Uh, what sources of progressive revenue would you advocate for uh, and how would you push for their implementation at the city? Absolutely. Um, I think I, I look to the fact that I know Transit Writers Union has identified 27 different options of progressive revenue. Some of them have different um, standing in uh, you know, what, what it would mean to implement. Some of them would require state action, um, but some of them are able to be implemented locally um, on a more immediate basis. Um, so when we look at ways as such as expanding Jumpstart, as well as exploring local capital gains, those are two that are um, the most expedient because we know the legal status of them. But I look forward to also working with our state partners to explore what are options we can pursue at the state level to create more options for local governments to implement them. And in terms of how, how we implement them, I think it's important that we build a large coalition to say this is a need because without progressive revenue, the quarter of a billion dollar budget deficit will mean dramatic cuts for our community. And so I believe that we need to have a, a strong coalition really as a rallying cry that our community needs this because we cannot afford to be cutting things like library hours and other critical services at this time. Thank you. I'm going to jump here for a minute, Jeremy and Barbara, since they have not had a follow-up. And then I think Dawn has a second follow-up. So Jeremy. Oh, I, I did have a follow-up. Oh, you, okay. 
Oh, did you already ask? If you already asked a question. Sorry, I've I've lost the plot. Barbara, let me go to you since you've not had a chance to ask a question, and then I will go to the second follow ups. So, um, Alexis, I'm very I'm fascinated by your work with the University of Washington financial um, picture, and I'm going. I just want to ask you, what is your approach to the budget shortfall in the city council? Absolutely. So knowing um, the bit that I, I do based on, you know, I have the same information that the public does. There's the budget portal where we can play around and understand what fund sources are funding current things. I think having a, a you know, I would approach this moment knowing what I do about Seattle's budget, that a number of programs were stood up with one-time money to address the COVID crisis. Um, looking at where are the investments, what's the timing of them, what's the fund sources of them, um, and evaluating and mapping that to community priorities as well. Um, I think it's important to, to understand, you know, that an underspend in an area should not necessarily mean a cut, but rather should ask the question, why are we underspending in a certain area? And what does community have to say about the priorities of that area? So I've, I've learned from my work at UW as well as government administration to thoughtfully think through and understand what's behind the numbers. Where are Where is that money coming from? What is it funding? And is it being expended in its full capacity? And if it's not, what's happening there? Um, and then having using that informed perspective to inform how we move forward and adjust things. Thank you. We'll do our second round of follow-ups from Don, Jeremy, and Alex in that order. Don, your second question. My second question is, what are your plans to utilize and incentivize the 1 billion housing levy funds that exclude potential I-135 payroll revenue to increase affordable housing in the city? Oh my gosh, that's a, a great question. Um, I So to that end, you know, I, I look at the expertise within the Office of Housing right now on some of the financing fronts and looking at, you know, being able to leverage that money with appropriate types of financing options like uh, the low income housing tax credit, for example. Um, and so to that end, you know, I am looking forward to hearing a bit more about like the, the current plans. I'd love to be able to bring in some additional community perspective on what the current plans may be and see where there's room for, for change. I think that we need to build um, more affordable housing along the lines that also accommodates for families um, and is in more areas across the city. So I am a proponent of zoning changes as well. Thank you. Let's see if Jeremy and Alex can give the questions really quickly um, so that we can get them all in in our time frame. Jeremy? Okay. Um, just wanted to uh, ask, uh, could you, what are your thoughts on the current proposal for, re for renewing the Move Seattle levy? I know on, on Friday there was an updated version that came out that seemed to adjust and align more with some of the community priorities. Um, I think I, I share with some of the community perspective that it didn't quite go to the, the level or scale that people were hoping for. I know there was a great coalition of transportation advocates as well as disability rights advocates and environmental justice groups that came together to formulate a vision for the level and types of investments we should be making. Um, so I, I would say my perspective really aligned with that type of, of work, and I would continue to like to see increased investment in our broader like infrastructure. Um, I can appreciate that there's, you know, still we're investing in our, our roads infrastructure, we're working on improved safety. So I would just voice, I think there's a lot of good things in there, but it's not to, to the scale that we need to really transform our transportation system if we say we're really about creating broader connectivity in the city. Thank you so much. And Alex, power three, let's go. Yes, just one quick question. Um, I just want to hear your perspective on, on the comp plan and what you would like to see in terms of like changes in zoning laws in the city. Yes, absolutely. Um, for And the most, oh gosh, <laughs> this is one I wish I didn't have a minute in. Um, um, more expanded transit oriented development. Is, is a huge piece of this. Um, paired with that, um, really expanding um, the, the regional centers and the identified um, areas, the, the, um, I, the um, pardon me, the, the term is escaping me. There are term urgent urban villages is coming up, but I'm thinking about the areas where um, that 
have been identified in the current draft plan, um, I think we can have more expanded areas where we have um, increased development um, in more areas of the city. So changing zoning across all of this, the city so we can have um, housing of, of all types um, in more places, um, examining also how we address floor area ratio. I know it's a little bit on, on the technical side, but um, and paired with that, again, pairing with anti-displacement strategies, I would like to see a much stronger anti-displacement strategy um, to ensure that, you know, how, how we've historically developed in the city has led to a tremendous amount of, anti of displacement and ensuring that as we're moving forward, we're actually really investing in communities that have experienced that and not propelling the same pattern of development that we have in the city. Thank you so much, Alexis. This ends the formal part of our interview with you. We'll pause for a second to end the recording.